Welcome back. Yeah, we're getting, there's just another 12, 13, 14, 15. So six more chapters to go, folks. We're getting, we're getting a little, we're past the point of no return. So we're getting there. We're le reading Ladies First, Maga Hat Romance, Book One by Liberty Adams. Again, disclaimer, this is for entertainment purposes. I am not monetized. Uh, we're just having some fun here. Uh, and we're going to parody and transform the content. Uh, the holder of the original copyright is Ms. Liberty Adams herself. So, yeah. <laughs> Chapter 12. Four blocks later, when she turned the corner to her parents' street, she was hit with a shock that brought out the full force of the truth of what she had been trying to hide from herself in the world. Okay, first of all, I don't think this person takes the trolley, like, ever, because why is it that you'll take it for two stops and then get off, and then you'll take it all the way to your parents' house, oh, and then have to walk another four blocks? Like, where's this thing running? In the driveway of her parents' home sat Mike's beefy, very black super cab pickup truck. It was unmistakable. Her stomach bottomed out at the sight. He would be inside now, sitting in her parents' living room, they looking at him, and he looking back at them. Okay, what adult business owner man has a consideration or conflict with another adult? Because if she's a grad student, she's not a child. And goes to her parents. Her stomach bottomed out. Oh, okay. Whatever, she wondered, were they talking about? Yeah, indeed. She pulled out her phone to check the time. An hour since she received the summons from her parents. Two hours since Jack's admonishment in the building lobby. Three hours since the triumph at the induction tea. Two days since the blog post appeared. Not possible for all this to be related. Or was it? The guilt she felt at this moment began to unravel her inner story, telling herself to justify the lie that was careening through the blogosphere even now. In the front room sat her mother and father with grave faces. On the sofa sat Mike, awkward and uncomfortable, with his hands folded in his lap, tapping the pads of his thumbs together. He looked at her as though she were something he could chew up and spit out. Hello. She kept her face mild as she addressed her parents. Is this about your trip next week? She could think of nothing else to say to ease the strangeness. Her father cleared his throat. <laughs> oh my gosh. Ugh. She wrote a blog post. Her parents don't care. Her father cleared his throat and declined to address her question. Ominous. We've been talking to Mike. He and Mike both nodded men's curt nods of acknowledgement. Masculine, purposeful. And now we'd like to talk to you. One chair that anchored the corner of the plush oriental carpet remained vacant. It was a simple parlor chair, the type meant to keep people from staying too long. Ricky sat and waited. Her mother held up a sheet of paper with typing. Did you write this? Her anger grown by the minute, Ricky took the page. It was like middle school. Indeed. It was like middle school all over again when she'd been busted for some transgression or other. She's not in middle school. She's in grad school. None of this would happen. Busted by the people she most cared about. She wasn't certain if Mike belonged in the care about category, but he was a nice man anyway, and she'd used him under false pretenses for her own gain. And all he'd been to her was a decent human being. Even more, he'd gone out of his way for her, kept her from harm when he didn't even know who she was, saved her from a savage mob, fed her, taken her into his home, and seen her safely back to this house. Right now, she wished like hell she wasn't thinking these thoughts. Mike came by an hour ago, her father said. It seems like this writing, this Petrus parlance, as you call it, has caused him quite a bit of trouble. My job site, Mike broke in. Ricky noticed he was dressed in the same white shirt and work pants as the ra rally. His boots, as heavy and lumbering as before, held him firmly in place. Or maybe his feet were just large. What? 
He glowered beneath bushy brows. It's crawling with punks. He pointed to the paper in her hand. The ones who saved you from me in that piece of crap fiction. You lied. You lied about me, about everyone, about the whole rally. I kept you from getting hurt. We ate together at the diner, had coffee. I brought you here to your parents' house because you didn't feel safe going back to your apartment. You know, like, in case you forgot, right? Ricky's mom looked as if she wanted to cry. Her father's face was a mix of anger and disbelief. She couldn't look at Mike at all. Just hearing his words, accusing, as if she were the cause of this, was bad enough. But she wondered something, too. How had Mike been outed? I'm sorry, she was stumbling, trying to say the right thing, trying to understand the situation. I never meant for this to happen to you. I made sure to keep anything out of that blog post that might get you or anyone else identified. Mike walked over to her and showed her his phone. Look, he said, here's my business. On the screen was the video of of, on the screen was video of a mob of black clad young males blocking an access point in a construction site fence. No, no. Jack, the building super, had just called her out for lying. Now her parents and Mike, along with them, were confronting her with the truth. She wished she didn't care. She couldn't bear at this moment and before these people to admit she'd done wrong, even though it was staring her in the face. They simply didn't understand what was at stake. They could all go to hell. <laughs> she stood up. So I suppose it's my fault you happen to be on the wrong side. Mike shoved the phone into his pocket. Wrong side? I treated you with kindness. You get me doxxed and I'm on the wrong side? Ricky's father broke in. If you deliberately besmirched Mike's reputation, that's evil, Ricky. I'll say it. It's evil. But nobody was supposed to know. I didn't mean for this to get out. What? Okay. This is, I mean, we're beyond nonsensical at this point. Ricky sat down as she skimmed the page her mother handed her, looking for something that would have caused Mike to be doxxed. Even though she knew by heart nothing was in there, she wished she had stayed back in Amber's living room, puffing a cigar and sipping whiskey among the carefully styled bookshelves and the potted palms. Ugh. Won't be kissing anybody tonight if you've been smoking cigars. That's disgusting. It wouldn't have erased the problem, but at least she could have pleaded inebriation to her, friend, her parents and delayed this confrontation. And then she remembered. She mentioned out loud the name of Mike's job site at the T. Somebody, likely Amber Maroney, turned it over to the powers that be on the left. <laughs> what? Who are these smoky, shady people? You know, if you've ever tried to get anybody together, maybe things have changed in the days of social media, but I don't think so. Trying to get four people in a room at once is just, no, you can't do it. So, so I don't know how they think these people organize, but people show up when they feel like showing up. Mobilization had happened instantly. It was her own big mouth that outed him. The carelessness caused by the necessity to keep her facts straight. When she looked at Mike, she saw in herself the very worst in human nature. And nothing she did ever could make up for good intentions. Her father was right. She deliberately smeared a good man, a good movement, good people, even a good president. Uh, yeah, now we're really off into flights of fancy. Who she thought she despised. He called it evil. Tough to swallow. You know, no. <laughs> I can tell you most people of Ricky's parents' generation don't even know or care what doxing is. And quite frankly... Doxing somebody on the internet, like if it's a business with a name and address that's in the phone book, you can find it. And yet back at Amber, she'd had the approval, the atta girls of the sisterhood and of her readers. And to them, the lie would not matter as long as she maintained it. That would be her choice to make then. Accept the truth and try to make it right or double down on her lies. Mike is the nicest young man, Ricky. He knocked on the door this morning. He was very polite. He apologized for bothering us. 
He told us right away who he was and why he'd come to the house. Yeah, because, you know, nobody else ever does that. Ricky's mother stared at her with a hardness she'd never seen before. It felt worse even than when she broke curfew in high school. But she wasn't 15 anymore. She was 10 years older, and the high school she felt unjustly accused. She was the sinner. They stood in judgment. It was the same now, except now the consequences were far greater. Well, no, actually, it's not that much different, and it's not much more consequential. She'd never, ever considered this would happen, and it was too late to prevent the damage done to Mike. His business, his reputation, his workplace. A tiny buzz came from Mike's phone. Excuse me. He fished it from his pocket, scanned the screen, and then keyed in some letters and stood up. Sorry, but I gotta go. This, that was my form, and the police are arriving on the scene. They want to talk to me. He shook hands with Ricky's mom and dad. Frank and I can't thank you enough for your kindness. Ricky's father spoke. And thank you, Mike, for watching over Ricky at the rally. We are so sorry this had to happen. Mike turned and faced Ricky. I've got to go try and undo some of the damage. As, she, as he walked to the front door, she jumped from her chair and caught up with him in two strides. Wait! Mike turned back in silence. He fiddled with his hands in his jacket pockets. She could hear the jingle of keys. What can I do to make up, Mike? She said plaintively. I want to make it up. He looked at her, his face nearly white. Make it up. He shook his head as he walked out of the house without replying. She didn't want it to end this way. She couldn't let him leave with no resolution. She had to try to fix it, even though she didn't know what that would be. She caught up to him as soon as he unlocked his truck door and opened it. I'm so sorry, Mike. I know how this happened and it's my fault. I accidentally said the name of your job site aloud during the meeting today. Someone did the research and doxed you. I'm so sorry. I never thought this would happen. He gave her a look. Yeah, you never thought. That much is true, he said. He took a revolver from the console compartment of his truck, opened the cylinder to check for rounds, then snapped it shut and secured it to a bracket under his dashboard. What are you doing, she said. When you get threats to your life, he said, you need a way to defend yourself and you need to keep it handy. See, in Canada where we have sensible gun laws, that's actually illegal. You have to keep it locked. <laughs> Please be careful. She didn't know what else to say. He spoke through clenched teeth. Why don't you stop talking and start doing something good instead of destroying? Oh, gosh. He climbed in his cab and started the engine. Ricky could only watch as he backed away slowly from the driveway and took off down the street. The house was quiet when she came back inside. She tiptoed into the basement, miserable. She didn't want to see or talk to anyone. Mike was a generous and decent man who went out of his way to protect a perfect stranger when that perfect stranger was oblivious to the danger she faced. And then that perfect stranger had used the excuse of being a perfect stranger to destroy the livelihood and reputation of the generous, decent man. What? And why? For acceptance into a club of ungrateful hypocrites who wanted to destroy all that was good about people in society and destroy men too, especially men. When Ricky had turned into the poster child of using lies to destroy innocent people, and for all its lofty intentions, there was not a shred of good about it. <laughs> Before he left her parents' house, Mike had said to stop talking and do something good instead of destructive. He was right. Her apologies, her protests, her arguments were so weak in the face of his good acts. Yeah, because nobody can ever be as good as a MAGA hat wearing asshole. Except she, all she had were words, but words could be accompanied by an act. A blog post had destroyed a good man's reputation. Maybe a blog post could help to overcome that destruction. In one brief moment, Ricky threw off the false narrative of everything she'd brought, thought, brave and true and right, in the hopes of salvaging one good thing from this disaster. She decided to sacrifice everything she had thought important. Had proven to be false. That had proven to be false. She sat down in the basement room that served as her back at home quarters and fired up the desktop computer. Then she began to type. The words came slowly at first, then faster. After 30 minutes, she went back to reread what she had written. Her first paragraph stunned her. 
I've told you the story of the rally I attended. That role, that story was a lie. I now give you the story that is the whole truth, the entire truth. It begins with a man who lives by the rule, ladies first, and he lives every word of that. I know his rule firsthand, for he practiced it with me, even though my own acts in the face of his kindness were far from ladylike. As I grew into adulthood, I quashed the dream of every little girl who wants to marry her handsome prince. It was silly. It was all a result of centuries of white male oppression and privilege. Well, I'm here to tell you that handsome princes do exist. I met one. Let me tell you about him and how he saved me from the ravages of a violent anti-fascist mob after the rally and how he saved me from being completely taken over by the raving lunacy of what we call feminism today. Okay, what? Oh. Yeah, somebody taking you out for coffee is not going to defeminize you, defeministize you. Um, a feminist remains a feminist, especially if she's got a graduate degree in this stuff. And nobody with multiple degrees in gender studies is going to call anything about feminism raving lunacy. And this is clearly written by somebody with absolutely no understanding of what feminism actually means or what feminism is about. Certainly not, it's certainly not about your daddy and your potential boyfriend making you give up your entire way of thinking. I renounce that, and I'm here to tell you why. Chapter 13. After the spending, spending the night at her parents' house, Ricky woke up early and went out to run errands. Her tattoo appointment was later today. She planned to drop off her supplies at her apartment, pack a bag, pick up the tattoo money, and head back to her parents until her tattoo session. As she approached her corner of the street where the apartment house stood, Ricky heard the chants and shouts, all of it angry. Staying at the shade of Larkspur Avenue trees, her neighbor's only leafy block, she stopped. She crept alongside the wall of the corner drugstore, then peeked around the corner. The noise came from the front of her apartment building. A mob looking and sounding like the rioters that caused the mayhem at the rally was stationed in front. There were more than she could count, a pieced together mass of humans, flanked by sign carriers, many of them female. <sighs> okay. You can see it's getting kind of tiresome. And if I'm kind of dozing off a little, I didn't get a coffee today, so I'm a little bit tired. So I apologize for any eye closing or word slurring that happens. It's not because I'm drunk or anything. I'm just a little bit tired. Okay, so Ricky has come back to her apartment. She crept along the side of the corner drugstore. The noise came in front of her apartment building. That's where we left off. Sorry. A mob looking and sounding like the rioters, rioters that caused the mayhem at the rally was stationed in front. There were more than she could count. A pieced together mass of humans flanked by sign carriers, many of them female. Were any of them members of her sisterhood, she wondered? Sometimes she had participated in acts of protest when right wingers spewed particularly vicious hate speech. Now she appeared to be a target of the same tactics. Her mea culpa post, as she called it, was long and rambling. She came clean on everything, renouncing her beliefs, which she called a state of astonishing incoherence, pot, meat, kettle, and especially renouncing her treatment of Mike. So the mob, once attacking the rally goers, once attacking Mike the redneck, had set itself upon her. The other thing that's really funny about all this nonsense is just how inflamed a sense of self-importance these people have. They, they think that if they say anything, this 
so this m massive of crawling black clad freaks is going to somehow descend upon them. I mean, that is a very fearful way to live, don't you think? The rioters wore black hoods and masks. Some carried bats, some slapped weapons grade bike locks. <laughs> There's no such thing as a weapons grade bike lock. A bike lock is a bike lock against their thighs. <laughs> I'm just thinking of the <laughs> were any of them snapping her fingers like the freaking jets. She imagined, no, she knew for a fact that some carried knives beneath their sheet shirts. She flattened herself against the wall and scooted back out of sight. Never before had she given a second thought to the protests of anti-fascist groups against the injustices of the alt-right. But this group, probably the same one protesting Mike's job site, was now out to get her. And a new wave of fear hit, as for the second time in one week, her physical safety at the hand of leftist thugs was at risk. She checked the time. In four hours, she was due for her tattoo session. She was carrying supplies and a bag of ice. She needed to drop off the items, pick up the money for the tattoo artist, plus school materials for the upcoming week, and hole up at her parents' house while they were gone on vacation, where she could nurse her tattoo wounds in peace. She dialed Karen's number. Karen picked up immediately. Ricky! Karen sounded frantic. Ricky, what's going Karen, what's going on? There's a mob in front of the house. I'm at the drugstore outside. Is there any way to get in the building? You can try the service entrance, but there are spotters out there, Ricky. I looked. But I need to get in, she paused as the gravity set in. They might try to kill me. They're not going to kill you over a blog post? Oh, I was a feminist. Now I'm not a feminist anymore. Like, seriously. Close fucking ranks and get over it. <laughs> they might try to kill me. Can you blame them? What? Look, Ricky, there's a sign out there. I don't know if you saw it. I'm looking at it now. It says Petra the Fascist. That sums it up, Ricky. It's what you are. <sighs> She was firmly in her new world and hearing the new old world. She was firmly in her new world and hearing the old world words being hurled at her. That's a mouthful. I'm sorry about that. She knew them, knew them well, but they no longer made sense. The new readership tripled in just 24 hours, all of whom celebrated Ricky as Petra's lies, now sought to bludgeon her for writing the truth. She'd become one of them. One of Mike, her family, the rally goers, even the president's supporters. Ricky, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Karen, my tattoo session is in four hours. I still need to get in and get my things. And my money's in there, too. Things? Money? Ricky, you wrote a blog post yesterday full of the most vile hate I've ever read. You committed violence against these people who only want to right the wrongs of the oppressor against the marginalized. And you've put the rest of the neighborhood in danger. As soon as this is over, I'm leaving, finding another place to live. This friendship is over. Oh, and I called Amber Maroney and thanked her for outing you. She told me to tell you your membership is in the sisterhood is hereby revoked. Karen hung up. Ricky looked at her dark phone screen. The mob was still outside, quieter now, but she doubted they'd be leaving anytime soon. She peeked around the corner again. If anything, the numbers had grown. She needed a plan. She could cancel her tattoo session, but she would not give the mob that power. She would not let them have even one small victory. For years, she'd planned and saved for this day. She would not change it. But keeping her appointment meant that she must face the mob. And to Ricky, facing the mob meant more than making her way through an angry, violent crowd. Facing the mob meant cleansing the evil that once lurked in her soul. What? All of this over a couple of blog posts and a rally? What? Facing the mob meant rekindling the value she'd been raised with and had recently found in a man called Mike. And that man called Mike wore steel-toed boots and could break through walls of violent thugs. She prayed for the first time in a long time. He would apply his grandfather's rules to her now, despite his anger, if she asked him to. She brought out her phone, hit the number, found his number, and hit dial. Redway Mike! Her hands shook when she heard his voice. She sank against the wall, but she didn't hesitate. Mike, it's Ricky. 
pause, silence. Yeah, gruff, terse. She was getting clobbered from all sides today, but Mike was her only hope to salvage this important day. He was ladies first by his own admission all the time. His grandfather had made certain of it. Even though she didn't feel like a lady at the moment, he could fi she could fix it. There's a mob outside my apartment. I need help. Call your roommate. She hung up on me. Oh, yeah? Finally, some animation came into his voice. She won't help. Can't help. Not with that mob. Call your mom and dad. I'm busy right now. He already called her mom and dad. <laughs> call your mom and dad over a blog post, but not over a violent gang of thugs that want to kill you. Hmm... Although, truthfully, nobody wants to kill anybody. None of this would ever happen. I mean, this is ridiculous. Anyway, they left for vacation. I could use a vacation myself. Look, what do you want from me? I'm in the middle of a job. I thought you were a supplier calling me back. No! The sobs building up were becoming harder and harder to hold in. Tattoo or no tattoo, she had to get into her apartment. She was weighed down with supplies and holding a melting bag of ice. I've got to get in there. I'm afraid I'll get hurt. A mob. Again. Yes, they're after me, she shouted, nearly hyster <laughs> nearly hysterical, needing to reach that sweet gallantry from the night they met. I wrote another blog post after you left yesterday. I told the truth, the real story. The new story went viral too. Only now the mob is against me. Ricky felt smaller in size with every plea she uttered. What do you want me to do? Take me through the crowd. Help me get into my apartment. Beat them up for me. Which, you know, again, never happens. Well, I can't even take delivery of some materials here. Pause. Look, I'm really busy. You'll have to find another way to do it. She resorted, she resorted to tears, the only thing she had left. Please, Mike. She pushed out the words between sobs. I'm afraid. I need your, I need your help. It worked. He was silent. She hated herself for it, but the sobs were real. Every tear was real. There was no faking this helpless and female self. Wait a second, let me call you back. Where, can you wait where you're at? The fear subsided. He would come and help her after all. Yes. Her voice came out tiny the way she felt at the moment. Less than a minute passed before he called back. I just talked to Michelle. She's at the house. Go there and wait. I'll be there as soon as I can. He hung up. She had no choice but to do what he told her. For the second time, she was under his protection. It was a feeling she could get used to. And she wished for more of it, for more of him. She emptied the bag of ice onto a sidewalk planter with a live oak tree and headed back to the trolley station. All right, I think we'll leave it there for now, kids.